The difference between Vashti and Esther, they did the same thing. The same thing Vashti did is the same thing uh, Esther did. An act of defiance, an act of disobedience. The difference between both of them is that Vashti was working alone. Esther was backed by God. Esther had the gods to also challenge a system. Now, in this case, it was not as bad as Vashti's zone of like, oh, come out and dance and let everybody be looking at you right but she had the guts to stand up and say you know what something is being done and it's not right and i'm going to do something about it but in this case esther is working with god so she's not alone she's backed by priesthood she's backed by god so when she goes out there she knows she's not alone um if you can grab the link and share it with someone um i appreciate that as well but it is my hope that many people, women especially, and not just women, would be able to listen to this message. Because that thing that Shade said when she made the call for the firstborn son, uh, even though we're in a group of women, you know, this is a women's meeting, and she called for the firstborn son, um, you know, it's very crucial. So it is my hope that as many people as are able to can listen to this message because you have to really understand what's at stake, what you're up against what the playing field is okay um and that way you understand how to coordinate yourself you know okay let me go on and try to get into the teaching this this afternoon and i pray to god for grace 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 to deliver as much of it as we need to go away with this week and if we can't finish it up next week we continue father i thank you for today i commit this time of fellowship into your hands I thank you because of how mindful you are of us. And I thank you that you are taking this time to speak to us. You are taking this time to speak, even though through my vessel, but you are taking this time to speak through, through me and to us. It's as though you've gathered us onto yourself, into one room, sitting together in one accord, and we're looking directly at you, hearing you speak to us. So Lord, I ask that even as I share today, that it be that you are the one speaking through me. Let your people hear what you have for them, not what I have, not, you know, any agenda or plan or structure or thing I put in place, but just what you are saying to your people. We need to hear this from you today. We need to, to, to leave here with this assurance of the word that you've given to us. So Lord, I yield my vessel. I yield my vessel. I decrease that you might increase massively even in our midst today. And I ask, Lord, that as many as are going to hear the word today, that they leave here with strength in their spirit strength in their soul and strength even in their physical bodies in jesus name we pray amen thank you father for your word coming to us with great power thank you once again for joining the bible study today and um, for those of you who are online and are following on youtube you can see the topic and so this is not even necessarily a new topic i had taught on this during the um during the King's Arrow lunch, I guess you would say that, yeah, that was a King's Arrow lunch last year. And unfortunately, the stream was really poor. Um, the network was really bad where we were because um, it was raining and so a lot of the message got lost. So even though people were like logged on and all of that, um, it was really hard to follow because it was so choppy. And to make things worse, the footage actually, we didn't get to keep it because I think they had discarded it. So we didn't get to have like the raw file so that we could just get that message. But today I felt the Holy Spirit push me in this direction. And so I'm going to be teaching um, based on that topic as well today. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to everyone who's listening to me. Okay. And so today we're going to be looking at the topic of the book of Esther. It's one that, you know, I know many of us are familiar with and many, many groups, you know, many women groups, like we all talk about the story of Esther and all of that. And I know even in many settings, you know, when we're praying about favor, when we're like, oh God, we need to receive favor. You know, many times the story of Esther is used, right? To like sort of give the charge and like, you know, hey, you know, look how Esther found favor with the king and all of that, just a random, you know, um, orphan girl. And um, she found favor with the king and all of that. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that's a beautiful teaching but I think that when you pause long enough to look at the story of Esther you find that there's more going on in there and that's what I really want us to focus on that's what I really want us to center on today so I ask that you please keep your minds open your spirit open hear this deep within you um, so that the Holy Spirit is able to tell you something so I'm going to start with 
just I'll start where the Holy Spirit allows me to start okay and then we'll start opening up certain things okay when I think about the story of uh, Esther you find that is less about like I said this whole thing of oh you know um, favor I mean is there and it's it's really good but there's so much more okay that's I think that's essentially what I'm trying to establish is that there is so much more in the story of uh, uh, of Esther and that's what I want us to um, look at today so I think about this book and I think about what's going on in that whole setting and I realized that there are a few things that we could pull out from there and I want to start from the beginning okay because when we look at the book of Esther the initial uh, portion of it it opens up with the story of Vashti really so not really the story of Esther, not really the story of Mordecai. It really opens up with the story of Vashti. And for many of us, we've read the story of Vashti and many times we've been taught, okay? Not that there's anything wrong with it, but we've been taught how Vashti is the model of disobedience and the model of lack of submission to a husband and how as women, we need to learn to not be like Vashti, um, you know, so that we can not offend, you know, in our homes and things like that. And I don't want to go down this road and I don't want to, you know, get on a soapbox, but I think you all know how I feel about these things. And that's why I keep saying, like, we need, like, a very rounded view on, on the word of God, right? Because it's easy to look at the story and consider that to be like, okay, this is about a disobedient woman. And so we need to tell women and we need to teach women how to not be disobedient, okay? I do not think that there's anything wrong with that message, but it's, I, I feel like it's such a small piece of, like, that story you know, when you think about the depth of what it offers to us, you know? So it begins with Vashti and that's uh, Esther chapter one. So please stay with me. I'm trying, I'm going to try to go as slowly as I need to. I don't think there's any need to rush it. Many of us have not sat down to really understand what's going on in the book of Esther. And it's why we don't really understand where we are and what we're doing. Okay. Please listen to it. It'll change the way you see your position in your family. It'll change the way you see what God has asked you to do. So that prayer Shade took very, very, very important. Okay? So Esther in the book of, or rather Vashti in the book of Esther, chapter 1, I'm going to just read for from uh, verse 10. Many of us know what was going on here. So the setting is that the king was having a party and he had invited everyone. It was a massive feast, you know, and um, it was going on in uh, Shushan, right? That's where they all were. So the king had invited people. He had invited all kinds of people. Um, and it was really a time, you know, to showcase his power, to showcase, you know, his affluence, just to showcase himself as a king, you know. And so <clears throat> he had gathered everyone. The Bible says, he said, um, people from many different provinces right like over a hundred like he gathered all, all of them and the bible records in verse 4 of chapter 1 it says this is when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty you know that's really what the goal of that meeting was right um i don't know what was being celebrated but the bible records that this was really his intention like you know what these people need to know who i am what i have how powerful i am and that's it and the Bible says, when those when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, you know, both unto the great and small. Many days they were in the king's, you know, palace. They were doing, you know, they were having parties, they were drinking, they were having a good old time. And verse 10, now we get to see uh, Vashti. And at that same time, you know, uh, Vashti was also doing her own piece, right? Her own responsibility as, you know, the wife. Like, okay, I'm going to host the women as well and do all of that. Okay, so she's doing what she, I guess, is supposed to do. But... The king decides in verse 10 it says on the seventh day when the heart of the king was merry with wine he commanded mehuman bista harbona bigta and abakta zeta and carcass the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of hasuerus the king everything is so instructive in this book shade please maybe we'll do like study on this one after you know the first one that you have everything is so instructive so he picks the seven chamberlains that served in his presence um, and he commanded them. He asked them to go bring Vashti, the queen, before the king. I'm reading, you know, from scripture it says to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. 
Now, this is something that for many of us, when we read it, it was like, so what's the problem, right? Like he loves his wife, he's proud of her, she's beautiful and he wants to show her off. And the funny thing is, I didn't even realize <laughs> this initially. Like, like I said, many of us, we just read through the book of Esther because we want to get to the parts so that we can confess that we receive favor, okay? So, but what he was doing was that he, you know, he's already shown off everything he has, right? He's shown off his things, he's shown off his gold, he's shown off all of his affluence. But there's one more thing he needs to show off and that's Vashti. So he sends for her so that he can show her off to the people. And the Bible records here in verse 12, it says, But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. I want to pause here, and I'm really trusting the Holy Spirit to help me direct the, the message so that the whole thing is as like properly connected. Okay, so on the surface, it looks like this is a teaching. This is a lesson in disobedience right like how to not be a disobedient wife how to make sure that you know you obey and you know all of that right because that's what happens I mean if you ask me right the king sent for her as her king and she refused to come so it only makes sense that um, the king is angry and upset about this thing so yes don't be a disobedient wife all of that but you take a step back and you look into that story deeper and you will understand some things. Now, this is something that was even shared with me after I had given the position that I, I had on Vashti. I said I really understand Vashti's position because it's not so much that Vashti was being disobedient. When you study that story, you'll find that there were some things that happened in those days. And while the Bible is not very explicit, the, the book of Esther is very interesting. Because one day we'll talk about what it meant for all of those ladies to be gathered there and for the king to be checking them out. But anyway, so Vashti, being queen, is summoned by the king. But in those days, apparently what used to happen was that the king would want to show off the queen's beauty. Not her facial beauty, but to show her off. So apparently back in those days, they would have you know, the queen or whoever he wanted to show off in that way, which, you know, would likely be the queen, put on some, you know, I guess, interesting attire so people can look on her. I hope you understand what I'm trying to explain here. So this is not her coming out in like this, you know, beautiful, you know, regalia and this, you know, royal apparel. No, it's more so to show her off. Look at how beautiful she is. Look at what I'm working with, right? That's what they will call the queen out for. And so her, her, her assignment is to come out and parade her goods <laughs> and show them off, you know, to the, to the, would I say, praise of the king. Because everybody's like, wow, look at the king's wife. So Vashti decides and says, you know what, I'm not coming out. And because of that, the king was angry enough and actually sat down and they, they actually talked about it. Like, okay, so what are we going to do? And they came to a decision. And decided you know what because the, the queen did this thing in the eyes of everybody you know everybody who has seen it now you know let me just read it it says but this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women this was the the reason that they decided to take the position let me even start from 15 it says what shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains and Memucan answered before the king and the princes Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. So essentially, their, their anger was not even so much that the king was, was disrespected. Yes, it's good. It's, that's, that's established. But they were also very upset because they said, if they find out that Vashti had the effrontery to come against the king, to push back, to say no, if they find out that Vashti had the guts to stand up to the king, if they find out that Vashti dared to refuse something that the king asked for. If they find out that Vashti dared to go against this tradition, 
then our wives will have the guts to do the same. They will despise us in their own eyes and they will do the same thing. So verse 18 says, Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. So if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Please take note because all these things are important. To another that is better than she. Okay? And so the king acknowledged that and he agreed that that was fine. And they put that in place and they booted Vashti out. Now, even though traditionally we look at this story of Vashti as disobedience, I actually really, I, I, I stand with Vashti, if that's how I would put it. Because what Vashti did was that she had the guts, she had the effrontery to um, confront a system, to confront a tradition, to confront a culture, to confront something that wasn't right. She had the, 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 the guts to stand up, to look at something that was out of place, something that had happened before her. It had been happening this whole time. But it came to her, and maybe in the past she had accepted it, she had been okay with it, but this time she's like, you know what? Something is really wrong with this thing and I'm just not gonna do it. I'm pretty sure she had a sense for what the consequences of her actions would be, but she was willing to do it. So she stood up and said, I'm not going to do it. And she suffered for it. She had to bear the consequences. She had to be pushed out of her, um, of her seat. And according to those men, they picked another who was better. Don't forget that term. Another who was better than she. And in the king's mind, that was Esther. So today I'm not going through the whole system of like how he selected and how she did this and that. But the one who was eventually chosen as the one who's better, who was better than she is Esther. So Esther was, um, I almost said hired. <laughs> Esther was picked and put in her place as queen. But I want you to understand this, that Vashti, what she did, even though she wasn't successful in her endeavor, she set a precedent. She made a mark. Yes, she wasn't able to follow it through. She wasn't able to, to push it all the way to, in fact, get that whole system taken out of the place. But she made a mark. She made a mark that was, was strong enough that those men, those princes, decided that something strong has to be done. This is not just something else. Because if every other woman hears that Vashti had the guts to challenge the system, they will do the same. And this is where many of us are today. This is where many of us are today. So Shade was talking about being the first one in your family, the one who's you know, standing up as like a gatekeeper, the one who's the first to really commit to Christ and priesthood and all of that. And the reality is that some of us come from backgrounds where perhaps nobody even believed in Christ. But for some of us, we come from backgrounds where we had parents who actually did believe in Christ. They were Christian. They had some form of knowledge of God. You know, if you ask them to tick a box, they would take Christianity. But there were some things that, you know, they still were doing, you know, they weren't exactly like a pastor or whatever, but like, you know, if you ask them to fill a form, they choose Christianity. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, that, you know how they say today, they say, they say Vashti walked so that Esther could run. Because many times it takes one person, one person who's going to be willing to stand up and oppose a system, a demonic system, an unjust system. It takes that one person who's willing to stand up and challenge it for things to change. So Vashti stood up and did that. Now the problem Vashti had was that she was working alone. She was working from her willpower. She was working from her, you know, passion. She was working from what she felt was right versus wrong. That's why you and I are different. Because when we stand up in our families, when we stand up to do things, we are not standing up like Vashti. We're not standing up alone. We're standing up knowing that we're backed. 
The difference between Vashti and Esther, they did the same thing. That's why I'm, I'm saying God should just help me get it because we can't go through the whole book of Esther. The same thing Vashti did is the same thing uh, Esther did. An act of defiance, an act of disobedience. The difference between both of them is that Vashti was working alone. Esther was backed by God. Esther had the gods to also challenge a system. Now, in this case, it was not as bad as Vashti's zone of like, oh, come out and dance and let everybody be looking at you, right? But she had the gods to stand up and say, you know what? Something is being done and it's not right and I'm going to do something about it. But in this case, Esther is working with God. So she's not alone. She's backed by priesthood. She's backed by God. So when she goes out there, she knows she's not alone. When she goes out there, what she's doing it's not something that's powered from her soul. It's not something that's powered from zeal. You know the reason that many of us are in this position where we're afraid to stand up in our families, where we're afraid to take up the position of priesthood, is because someone in our family has stood up like Vashti. Has, they, they stood up in the past with a lot of zeal. And many of you know it. So you're, you come from families where like maybe when they see you now, the way you're praying and praying and praying, they will tell you things like, ah, that's how so-and-so auntie prayed, dressed. You know, it's just, just release this thing. That is how this other auntie prayed. That's how this other uncle prayed. That's the reason why many of us today find it hard to stand up and take the place of priesthood because there's been an example of Vashti that was set in the family. And so this is what Satan looks to do. That's what Satan does. It's an intimidation tactic. It's what he does to intimidate people. If I make a solid enough example of one person in this family, it will deter everyone else from standing up to challenge me. And that's what he did with Vashti. That's what was going on there. So I'm trying to call your attention to this whole thing. It's beyond a wife that does not listen to her husband. This is more about standing up to confront foundational issues. This is about standing up to confront familial patterns. This is about standing up to confront generational curses and things of that sort. If Vashti arises and Satan makes it his assignment to make an example out of her. Why? Because if I can make a strong enough example out of Vashti, no one else will have the effrontery to do anything. So everyone else who comes through that family would be willing to sit down quietly and allow the reign of evil to go through that family. Why? Because so-and-so auntie tried and she got taken out. So-and-so auntie stood up and she was knocked out. This is what's going on. I want you to understand that there's nothing that you're fighting in your family that is new. There's nothing going on with you today. No opposition that you're seeing in your family that is new. It's one of two things. Nobody ever stood up in the family to try to take it down. Or somebody stood up and they made a Vashti example out of her. And so everybody has decided to be quiet. The good news is that you're not Vashti. You're not working by the Vashti system. You're working like Esther, one who is backed by God, one who has priesthood that supports her activities, that supports her actions. So when you think about what they were dealing with at that time, it was not so much, oh, let, you know, people being obedient, people staying within, no. We are looking at what it means to confront generational patterns generational things okay the things that you need to take down in order for the rest of the family to make progress we're going to go into this as deeply as we can and so we're going to be doing some uh some history lessons i want to um pull this out because there are some names that are used in this uh in this thing, there are some names that are used in here that you have to take note of. Some things that we see here is like for us, we're like, okay, this is just one other story, but it's not. If you take a look at the person that they were um, up against, they were up against Haman, the Agagite. This is the person that was their biggest problem in the story. Because prior to that, Esther was going to sit down in that palace. She was going to just enjoy a soft life. She was going to be a wonderful little queen, not bothering anybody. Okay? She was really going to keep the peace. Don't rock the boat. Don't do anything out of order. Okay? She was going to follow that template. Why? Because there's a Vashti example. So before you even step in, I'm pretty sure there are people who come to tell you in that kind of environment, let me tell you, this is what happened. This is this, this is that. So nobody should shake anything. Nobody should, you know, just behave yourself. And I'm pretty sure Esther came in with that same mindset. 
and I'm just going to be quiet. I'm just going to let things be, and I'm just going to do my own little bit, stay in my own little corner, where you know, wherever um, I'm asked to stay. But when you look at the story of Haman, then you know that there's a lot going on. So when I researched this and I was thinking, you know, because uh, I was trying to see what the the meaning of the name is, there are different, you know, sources right so there are places that you know will give you one meaning and there's the other places that will give you um another but one of the things i found to be the meaning of the name Haman was tumult noise chaos anarchy this problems very interesting very interesting that's one of the meanings of that name chaos just tumult in other terms warfare in other terms warfare when you look up the meaning so look it up so you'll find some other places where there's the meaning they'll say you know it's illustrious magnificent all of that but there are other places where you find the meaning and it also denotes uh tumult chaos but anyway let's just stay with it what i'm even wanting to point out is not even so much um the uh what's it called it's not even so much the meaning of him and it's really his heritage the Bible describes him, it says it's Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite. I wonder why they would call him um, Amidatha. Or rather, I wonder why they would call him um, the Agagite. Because actually, there isn't such a tribe. There was a king called that. But there isn't such a tribe. So you look at... Uh, um, Haman, one of the meanings of the, uh, his name being um, tumult. Then you look at Hamidata, one who troubles the law. That is, this person comes to make trouble. That's the meaning. That's why I'm saying, please take the time and do a deep study of the book of Esther. You realize that this book is so much more than, you know, learning to not be disobedient or, you know, confessing and receiving favor. It's so much. Okay? So if you look at what these names, Haman, Haman, Hamidata, and all of them represent, they actually are pointing to the same thing, trouble, warfare. And that's what came up against Esther. That's what she faced. And so you look in the book of uh, Esther and you find that Esther has to partner with Mordecai, right? In order to get through the situation. But I want to show you something. Because when we're saying that you've been the first in your family, we really understand how it can get tiring. How you want to back down and be like, you know what, let me rest. This thing is too much. This thing is a lot. But it didn't start here. It did not start here. Now, let's go back. Because remember I said, Haman is referred to as Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite. Okay? Now, 1 Samuel chapter 15, I'll start reading from verse 1. It says here, it says, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So the instruction came from God. There is a monument of oppression. There is something that happened in this lineage. They did something wrong. Okay? So I'm appointing you to go there and take them out. Do not spare anything. Nothing. Old, young, baby, grown up, do not spare. Male, female. Because you know, usually they might like leave the females or something and then they will fight maybe just the men. But the instruction was very clear destroy everything from the greatest to the least everything then the bible records in verse 4 it says and saul gathered the people together and numbered them in telaim 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of judah and saul came to a city of amalek and laid wait in the valley and saul said unto the kenites go depart ye down from among the amalekites lest i destroy you with them for ye showed kindness to all the children of israel when they came up out of egypt so the kenites departed from among the amalekites and saul smote the amalekites from havila until thou comest to Shur, that is over against egypt verse 8 it says and he took agag the king of the Amalekites alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul 
and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and oxen and all of that, you know? And they will not utterly destroy them. They spared Agag and the sheep and the oxen and all of that, but they spared Agag. When the commandment from God was very clear, he said, spare nothing, not even a, a baby, not even an infant. He was supposed to say, not even a suckling. Don't spare any. And they refused to listen. They decided to spare uh, someone. They took the king Agag with him. And the Bible records here. This is what Samuel said when he came to meet Saul. I'm going to read from verse 14. It says, And Samuel said, What minute then this bleating of the sheep? Because he had asked Saul, like, you know, did you do, you know, what had happened, all of that? And um, Saul was like, Oh, I, I, you know, I did everything. I, you know, I blessed be the Lord. Verse 13, I guess I could read from there. It said, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord, for I have done everything as the Lord asked me. And then Samuel said, So then what meaneth this bleating of sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which are here? And Saul, and Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spare the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. The rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee, what the Lord had said to me this night. And Samuel said, when was, when thou, you know, I don't want to read this whole part um, of what Samuel said to Saul, but I want to go to 20. He said, and Saul said unto Samuel, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And Samuel had to ask him, what do you think God cares more about? Obedience or sacrifice? I don't need the sacrifice. What I needed you to do was obey. What I needed you to do was obey. But the people took off the spoil, they did all kinds of things and all of that. And Samuel had to do that job. Samuel had to do it. He said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him and all of that and then killed him. Now, why have I read this story? Because it's very interesting and very important to the story of Esther. So you can tell now that there is a lineage that comes from Agag, that's the Amalekites. Now, if you, if you do some search and you look down uh, Esther's history, Mordecai specifically, you'll find that they come from the tribe of the Benjamites. And where does Saul's, uh, Saul's family come from? The same tribe. Are you following me? Are we together? Please let me know if we're together. I know that we did a bit of reading, but I needed to just kind of lay the foundation, establish where we're going. Thank you. Okay. So the Bible describes Haman as Haman the Agagite. So you see, the interesting thing is, if you didn't have enough of that history, then you don't know where that comes from. But that thing should really mean Haman the Amalekite. That's what it is. But you know how somebody can establish a system of wickedness and, you know, a certain government in a certain place and they, can be, they begin to call everybody else after their name. That's what happened. Haman the Agagite is really Haman the Amalekite. That's what it is. So if you trace Haman's lineage, he also runs up that bloodline, okay, of Agag. You trace Mordecai's lineage, he runs up that same uh, bloodline of Saul and Saul's father that go all the way up to the Benjamites. What I'm trying to explain here is this. This is typically what is going on. There's hardly things that people are fighting or dealing with today that started with them. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So many times when we read the story of Esther and Haman and Mordecai, we're looking at it and thinking, oh, this Haman came and he's, you know, upsetting the, the children of Israel. He wants to harm them and all of that. And now they have to fight. It didn't start with Haman. It did not start with him. And that wickedness did not start from him. It goes up the chain. It goes up his bloodline. And so what you find today is that many of the battles that people are fighting are battles that someone before them did not finish. Someone before them was asked to finish it. Someone before them had the responsibility to finish it. Someone before them had the responsibility to keep that door closed, but they did not. So you find that many of the battles that people are up against. So when we, we talk here, we talk a lot about things that are foundational, things that are generational. And it's not because we just want to be deep. It's the, this is what is going on. So you can look at this story and think Haman, and, uh, Haman has beef with Mordecai. It is not the case. It is deeper than that. This is deep history. 
a history of disobedience that has been planted in a bloodline that has opened the door for all kinds of things. Did you see what the, um, uh, the Bible said in 1 Samuel? Let me go read that. It said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It said, I can, I can, I can, I can um, connect this thing. I can equate this too. It says, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So this thing that started in the bloodline, it started since the days of Saul. Saul established that landmark of disobedience that opened the door for a lot. Did you see what happened? Because very soon, Saul was rejected. Then he eventually had to go and start consulting all these other spirits and things like that. Because he had lost his place. Where did it start from? It started from disobedience. So when the Bible is saying that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, this is what it's trying to say. It runs deep. It begins with disobedience. Before you know it, you are already walking down that path. And guess what? A precedence is being set for a bloodline. A precedence is being set for a bloodline. Now there's that history of iniquity. There's that history of disobedience. There's that history of, of sin and all of that that is traveling down that bloodline. If you are with me, please indicate. I need, like, I just need to know that I'm not talking alone. Just please, I, I need your help with this. I just need for this session to be as interactive as possible because I want to know that you guys are following me. Thank you. So do you see what's going on? If this is all I can show, with, show you guys today, it's good enough. Because many of you are up against things and you do not understand that it really travels down the line. It travels far back. And you see what Satan will continue to do is that every time there is somebody who can rise up and is willing to challenge a system of evil, he will try to make an example of Vashti. Because if he can do that, then Esther will learn to be quiet. Esther will learn to keep her mouth shut and maintain herself. Don't rock the boat. Don't shake things. Just go the way things have been. Do not try to break out of the mold. That's what Satan tries to do. Because why should he bother to keep fighting many people? No, if I make one good example, then everybody else will fall in line. But unfortunately, Esther and Mordecai, they come from a different uh, uh, line. They're not like Vashti. Now, let me pause here. Because we are in a generation where people talk a lot about breaking generational curses and things like that. Many of us see it on social media. And for some people, what breaking generational curses for them means is that, you know, they buy a house because maybe their father didn't have a house um, or they now can, you know, buy a car or they can afford certain kinds of things because their father didn't have that or their mother didn't have that. When that becomes your definition of breaking generational curses, you are no different from Vashti. You are building something on zeal or passion. You are trying to fight something that has deep spiritual roots with, 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 um, with zeal, with, with, with your efforts. That's what you're doing. When you assume that breaking generational curses boils down to getting this kind of job or living in this kind of house or whatever the case may be, you know, you, 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 are, you are mistaken. Or finally getting married. Listen, that is an element of it, but it's not the root. When that is your whole viewpoint, when that is your whole scope of what breaking generational curses is, you are no different from Vashti. And it will not be long before Satan is willing to make an example out of you. So that is why we keep telling people, listen, you can use your zeal, you can use your passion to push through, to want to bulldoze your way through certain doors. Like, finally, I made it to get in a house. Finally, I made it to buying a car. Finally, I made it to doing this or that. But guess what? You cannot take down that system except you are backed by real priesthood. Because before long, you will become like Vashti, who an example was made out of. And as bad as that example was, it will cause every other person that comes down to be quiet. So when we say sit here and we encourage prayer, we ask people to pray, to keep praying, we do the mount up and all of that. It is because of this. Many of you are up against deep things. Your issue is not that you can't get a job. Your issue is not that you can't buy a house. What your issue is, is that there is something in the bloodline that needs to be taken care of. And you're not going to take care of it because you applied to 100 different places or because you hired the best person to put your resume. That's not what it's going to be. What you are up against is you're up against certain altars. So once again, let me point you back to what is going on. 
you are looking at a fight that spans generations. I don't even know how many generations existed between that King Agag and um, the Haman and all of that. I don't know how many generations existed between you know Saul and then Mordecai. We don't really know. If you do a lot of uh, you know some research, I'm pretty sure you can find it. But this is the reality: is that what Esther and Mordecai had to deal with in their time was something that was already set in motion by Saul. Saul opened the door to this thing by his act of disobedience, by his willingness to step into witchcraft, by his willingness to go, you know, do divination and things like that. This thing that they are fighting today, it started with Saul. So now they are up against it. So you can either decide to be quiet, let me not, you know, shake things, or you can decide to fight. Whether you are quiet or not, this thing will continue to try to advance is going to continue to make its way down the generations down the bloodline so many people today because of their unwillingness to stay in there and obtain the victory that god jesus has already secured they are essentially parking warfare they are essentially putting it in the parking lot that you know what our children will come back and face it let, let our children face it the danger is that this generation right now everybody is trying to even fight to keep them in the faith because there's so much that's going on in this generation especially with the digital space that a lot of people are exploring all kinds of things online now that are not even remotely connected to God they are exploring things that do not have anything to do with God so for you to leave that thing and say okay the children will fight it well good luck good luck but what kind of parents in their right mind would be willing to leave something down you didn't say let you leave a house let you leave money or whatever you want to leave um warfare for your children listen this is not the easiest position to be when you take up the position of esther it's not why because your life is on the line right that's what it feels like some days it feels like listen i just want to rest it feels like i'm just constantly fighting but this is what needs to be done because somebody has to stand up and take down the Agagite because Saul didn't do it. Someone has to take down the Agagite because Saul did not do it. That Agagite that was spared, that Agagite that was left, that is the same one that is still troubling them to till, the, till today. So that's why I said the things that you're up against in your family, the things that you're trying to fight, maybe not even you, maybe it's your sibling. It did not start from you but it very well can end with you. Because if you go through the whole story, if you go through, you know, uh, just a little bit um, ahead, then you'll understand that, um, you know, they eventually took Haman out. But I want to show you something that's very important. Because Haman, I don't know what got into his head. He stood up and said, you know what? Everybody has to bow to me. Everybody has to bow to me. And you cannot imagine what was going on in the minds of the people there. Many of the people, they didn't even care. It's like, you know what? Let's just, let's just be done with this thing. Just bow to him. What's it going to take from you? Just bow to him, right? Like, let him go with his problems. But Mordecai understands that, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. This is, this is not what we're doing. This is deeper than just letting a man have his way and go. No, this is deep. So there are many things I will do, hey man, but I will, what I will not do is bow. I'm sorry. Do your worst, but I will not bow. You know why that was important? Because, you know, many times we think that sometimes we give ourselves this excuse. Like we try to rationalize things like, okay, if I do this, maybe it will get this off my back. Like, okay, you're trying to play smart around the things of God, but it doesn't work that way. So Mordecai could have thought that like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to sacrifice myself. I'm just going to bow, you know, because, you know, I just want peace because, you know, it's easy to look at everybody else. Because, you know, at the point where Mordecai was, was holding on and standing his ground, it wasn't only just Mordecai that they were going to punish. They were going to punish all of the Jews. So it's easy for a person to look at things and be like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to let things slide. So let me just bow just so that, you know, others can be spared. Do not get deceived into these positions that Satan tries to tell you that you are helping God by backing down by keeping quiet that's no that's not that's not what you're doing what you're doing is they are yielding your ground to the enemy oh let me just keep quiet let me just keep the peace that's not what it is there's no peace 
as long as your family is being eaten up by the enemy, there's no peace. Somebody has to fight to establish that peace. And it might as well be you. So when Shade asked that question, many of us raised up our hands. Because indeed, we're the first ones in our family who are really standing up as Christians, who are really taking up priesthood, who are really seeing the need to pray, who are really, you know, doing what it takes to establish, you know, uh, uh, a firm routine and ground in God. So it seems as though everything that is supposed to happen to people, you are having to block it. You're having to stand in the gap and you just want to rest. You just want to chill like Shade. You don't want to bother anybody. You're like, I just want to chill. And even if you decide to go and be quiet where you are sitting, then they, they will come and meet you there. Why? Because you are the one who's holding the line. You are the one who's manning the bloodline. And you have to give the right response. You can give a response like Mordecai, or rather, unlike Mordecai, and choose to bow and be like, you know what, let me just bow. You can be like Esther and be like, let me just keep quiet in this house. If I open my mouth now, that's how they will see me. Let me just face my life. Or you can give the response that they gave and stand up and be willing to fight. And you see that Esther, at the end of all of this, you know, she's initially thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to get involved in this stuff. Like, you guys just do what you need to do. Please don't put, don't put me in this thing. But she had to be reminded. And maybe that's what this is for you today. It's a reminder of why you are here, of what this is really about. Yes, you would like to be comfortable. Yes, you would like to have a peaceful and quiet life. But unfortunately, the enemy has already declared war against your family. So there's no peace. There's no peace. You will have to take that peace by force. Someone has to get up and be willing to push the enemy back and say, you know what? You've come this far, but you can't go any further. You've come this far, but you can't go any further. You've harassed Vashti. And yes, she had to be booted out and all of that. But not me. I'm built differently. I move differently. I'm backed differently. I don't know what Vashti had her confidence in that made her, you know, stand up against the system. I don't know what Vashti had her confidence in that made her willing to stand up and oppose that evil system. But you see, at some point, someone has to be frustrated enough and get up the good thing is this, is that you're not getting booted out of anywhere like Vashti, because you're not her. Maybe they've set that example in your family. Maybe it has intimidated you. Oh, this auntie kept praying, but she still died single. This one kept praying, but she still died without a child. You know, all of that, those are just intimidation tactics from Satan. He tries to look for one person to make an example out of them. And not just a random person, someone who seems to be prominent. Someone who seems to be solid. Someone who seems to be a voice. Someone who seems to almost be the pillar. Hmm? Some of us have this story of like, oh, you know, because then I've heard some of you share that with me. Oh, when we were much younger, you know, um, my family had a lot of money or my dad was richer or whatever the case may be. But as we grew, something happened. That is exactly what Satan loves to do. Let me find the one that if I make an example out of them, that person it'll be loud enough so Satan looks at the family he doesn't even look to touch one of the uh, you know maids or whatever no is the queen himself that person who had the position of being the gatekeeper of the family but refused to rise in priesthood was then set as an example if you look into your family you can tell there's always that person if you look you can tell ah this one is probably the one carrying the weight of the family this is the richest uncle, this is the, you know, something, they are, there's, there's something. Because they represent something in the family. The potential for change. The person, the, the, the chance that God has to invade that family. But the question is, will that person get up and do what needs to be done? Will that person get up and partner with God? Or will that person get up with the confidence of Vashti only to have to be knocked back down? I'm telling you people today that what you're up against, you're not the only one. And you're not the first. But you very well can put it to an end. And what that means is that you stand up and you take your place and you be like Esther. So Esther in verse 15 says here, it says, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Now this is after they had tried to tell Esther, like, okay, this is going on and all of that. And she's like, 
please dears you people should not put me <laughs> in these your problems like i'm really sorry y'all are going through this but like i'm good over here and you see that's how many of us are sometimes well like you know what i've made it out i finally was able to leave this country you know i i'm no longer there with you people. i finally made it out of the village so you people shouldn't disturb me i now live in the city you know oh i was finally able to do this. like you feel that way like please my life is is good it's perfect it's beautiful please don't rope me into this fight but guess what that fight still includes you why that's what Mordecai told her he said for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time then shall there um uh then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed so yes you want to be quiet like please don't don't trouble me I finally made it out. I'm not looking for anybody's trouble. Nobody's looking for my trouble. So let me sit here quietly. But that's the message. You can sit down there quietly with your nice little job, with your nice little husband, with your wonderful little kids, your beautiful little car, your nice little bags, your nice little photos on your nice vacation as the proof that you've made it out. You can do that quietly, but for a while. Because even as the word says uh, here in verse 14, it says, you just sit down there and continue enjoying that palace life for now. Because very soon, <laughs> they will come and destroy you and your father's house. So that is why we keep telling all of us in this group, there's no room to sit back and just be like, oh, I'm just going to relax. I'm just going to chill. The problem is that many families do not have a single person who is standing in this position. That is the problem. So it's not that the issue is that big that it cannot be fixed. It's that there's not been a man to stand in a family and confront the system of evil, confront the pattern of destruction and put an end to it finally because they are backed by God. There's not been that person. So you see a family traveling five generations or four generations if they can trace it back. No woman can stay successfully in, a, in, a, in their husband's house. If they stay after a while, they will kick them out. If they don't kick them out, then they won't have a child. It's always something. Nobody can stay. So it's single mother after single mother after single mother after single mother. Or generations of the father was not doing well. Then the mother was having to run the family. Then they gave birth. Then that son too, you know, is, is not doing anything in life. You see families of people where people who typically have the ability to progress in life by every standard, they went to school, they, you know, they're smart, but something happened to them at some point in their life. At a particular age, at a particular stage in their life, something happened and it felt like their whole life came to a pause, came to a halt. And you're looking at, at them and you're thinking, this is a full-bodied, full-blooded human being. Why is this going on? Oh, down the line, somebody had this issue, this health issue. Somebody lost their mind. Somebody had this mental... You see, when you look at the way that medical science addresses some things, it lets you understand that the things that we're teaching were not making it out. Because when you go to the hospital as well, and you're even if you are new or you're an existing patient and you're coming to report something new that's happening to you, what do they ask you to fill out? Do they not ask you to fill out your family history? They ask you to fill out your family history. Has anybody in your family suffered um, high blood pressure? Has anybody in your family suffered from diabetes? Has anybody suffered from asthma? Has anybody suffered from mental illness? Have, like they ask you to fill those things out in the form. Why? Because even science knows that it's rare that some things start with the exact person that is presenting themselves. Many times and more likely, more than likely, there are other people in the family that had dealt with it. So you're father your mother may not have sat you down and given you the full lowdown the history i don't know if anybody sat mordecai down and gave him the whole history of listen this is what happened with saul and agag i don't know if anybody did that but medical science even if doctors sometimes will refuse to acknowledge god even they cannot dispute the fact that a lot of the things that people deal with are indeed generational if not, why do they ask you to fill those forms and answer those questions? Oh, let us know if anybody in your family has suffered uh, from this, has suffered from that. Why? Because it is true that there are things that trail a bloodline. There are things that trail a bloodline. There are things that trail a family. You can choose to be ignorant of it, but it's not going to change that truth. Your choice to be ignorant of it is not going to change the operation of that thing. 
You choosing to tell yourself, oh no, I'm not a new creation. Yes, you are a new creation, okay? But guess what? That monument of disobedience is still sitting in your family. Who's going to deal with it? Maybe you can escape for now, but guess what? It is still sitting until somebody actually addresses it. Until someone actually addresses it. So you go there and maybe, you know, a person goes there and they are, they are, they are checking them. They are doing their checkup. They ask them, is there any history in your family of, you know, breast cancer of this or that? Why? Because let's know how to take care of this thing. Why? Because if we look in the bloodline, we can tell what could potentially happen or we can explain what you are dealing with. It's there. It's in science. It's in science. So where do you think it comes from? Is because these are the truths. So you see generation after generation of woman who can't settle in a home, generation after generation of a man who can't care for his family, generation after generation of suddenly one of the kids just loses their mind. You know, after uh, uh, you look again, then somebody comes down with a, a particular illness. So a person's grandfather died from cancer, their father died from cancer, and now here they are. Listen, we cannot be ignorant. We can't be ignorant because for you to not understand the need to stand, take up priesthood, is to be like a sitting duck. Is to be like a sitting duck. And many times, because you have been the person to stand up to take on that leadership in your family, because you're the first person who's truly choosing to follow God, who's choosing, tr truly choosing to like pray and, 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 and rise in priesthood, it almost seems as though they take the weight of that family and hand it to you. Now you have to address those things. You have to address those things. You can address it or you can leave it alone. You can. You have a choice. So you see, Esther gives a response after Mordecai sent her a message that sit down there. Sit down there as a soft life queen. Sit down there as a baby girl. You just wait <laughs> because this thing is coming for you and it will take you out. You better stand up and fight with us or you just sit down there and let this thing take you out. That's what he said. He said, we will continue to fight. We will get help. But you and your father's house, you'll be destroyed. Do you understand what's going on? You are the person who's sitting down and choosing to be quiet. Because other people are choosing to find help for themselves. So if we as much as stand up and seek help, as Mordecai said, help will come for us. Help will come for us. One way or another, God will come through. But you who's sitting down and choosing to hide, you are the first person that will be cleared. And Esther responds. They says, then Esther bade them return Mordecai the son. So he says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast you for me and neither eat nor drink the uh, three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king. It's funny because one person's offense was refusing to go to the king. Another person's potential offense was going to the king. Do you see how... There are no rules for this thing. Satan is not playing a game that has rules. You are the one thinking that there are set rules. So if you behave in this way, if you obey in that way, then things will be fine. There are no rules in this thing. Satan doesn't play fair. That's what some, some of us really think. We really think that if we just sit down and follow the rules, newsflash, Satan does not play by rules. He doesn't. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. It takes somebody standing up and stop him and say, hey, no, not like that, not here. But what's important is what I want to uh, mention here. She says, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Do you understand that many times it takes people coming to this point of, you know what, this is it. What this is, is that you are 100% committed to the fight. Some of us are not yet 100% committed to the fight. We want to fight some days, then some other days we want to go and chill. We want to fight some days, then some other days we want to go cool off in the club. We want to fight some days, then some other days we want to go cool off. So, like, this is not how it works. Esther said, I'm going to do this thing. I'm willing to stand up. And if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. That is, whatever is going to happen is fine with me. But it will not be said that I did not stand up, that I did not do my part. It will not be said. This is where many of us need to get to. So that's why I was so blessed by uh, uh, Shade's charge and the prayer. 
Many of us will want to fight with one hand and hold on to iniquity with another hand. You can't do the same thing. You can't do that. You cannot fight iniquity while holding on to iniquity. Because this thing that's good on your family was established by iniquity. Remember what I said? It was Saul's disobedience that established this thing that they now had to fight with. And you cannot fight iniquity with iniquity. So some of us want to keep fighting it, but then we also want to continue doing this, doing that, and all of that. Without sharing too much details, I was sharing something that happened with me to my husband this morning because there was something I was just, you know, trying to navigate, trying to unravel. And that's why I said the words Shade used were very, very powerful. When she said, um, I think she said, um, we have to cleanse ourselves, like you have to be clean and all of that. I don't want to go down that road today. But you see, it was very interesting because this thing happened. And you know, I'm here asking questions. I'm like, what's going on? And I received a visitation and I'm thinking I should hear more, but that thing called cleanliness is what's the part. So when you look at Esther's process, you find that that was one of the first things that was done for her. But today is not the day for um, Esther's process. Maybe another day we'll look into it. Had two part process. But I wanna show you one more thing. Because many of us, this is kind of where we are. We feel like we've been fighting. We feel like we've been doing the best we can. And we are just wanting to throw in the towel. I want you to understand this, that you are not the first to feel that way. And you actually have a lot more within you than you think. You are able to go further. Maybe you're not able to go alone, but that's why we gather together as sisters. Because we're able to strengthen each other. We're able to remind each other of where we are, who we are, what we're doing. Somebody has to rise up and change the course of things in your family. The story has to be written differently. And that person has to be you. You are the one who's standing in place of priesthood. So you have to do it. This is where Satan has backed many of us into a corner. So it's just so much backlash, one after the other. One thing, you know, you try to pray today, then they come and press you. <laughs> you try to pray tomorrow, then they chase you. You're trying to do all of these things. You're trying to take it down. But it's almost as though the frustration keeps mounting. So here's the thing. Evil Satan knows what you're capable of. You're the one who does it. So 1 Kings chapter 19, I'm about to bring the message to a close. 1 Kings chapter 19, it says, this is after Elijah's showdown. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he, that he might die. Specifically what it said, it says, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. That was his thing. Not that, oh, Jezebel is too strong. That was not what he was saying. He didn't say, please take my life now because I'm too tired of this. He didn't say, take my life now because Jezebel is too much for me. He says, take my life now. It is enough. He says, because I am not better than my father's. You remember what I said about Satan being intentional about setting an example of Vashti. This is where he looks to back many of us into. To a place where you look at yourself and you begin to think, you know what? I'm no better than my father. Who do I really think I am? Thinking I can go up against this thing. Did my father not try? How many business did he, businesses did he not try to establish? Did my mother not try? How long did she not try to stay in that marriage before she truly had to run out for her life? And that is kind of where we are. Some of us, tired, weary, willing to throw in the towel because we're telling ourselves, we're like, I'm just done with this stuff because I'm no better than my father's. This is Satan's strategy to weaken you, not because you can't fight and win, so that you are willing to throw in the towel. But Satan knows who you are. He knows what you're capable of. He actually does. You're the one who does it. Because if you go back to the book of Esther chapter 1, it says here, 
when the kings decided, or rather when the princes and all of them decided to choose someone else to occupy Vashti's position, they said, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. They knew. They knew. Give it unto someone that is better than she. Listen, I, I ask you to take, because I haven't really gone through this book. And like I said, maybe we'll do a study. But I encourage you to go read the book of Esther and read it very slowly. Thank God there are not many chapters in there. Read it very slowly and hear what the Spirit of God keeps saying to you. It says, let's put somebody else in Vashti's position that is better than she. Obviously, they didn't realize what they were saying. But guess what? While you are looking and feeling exhausted, feeling like you need to throw in the towel, because in your mind, you're thinking, I'm no better than my father. I'm no better than my mother. I'm no better than that uncle. I'm no better than that auntie. Satan knows that you, in fact, are. You, in fact, are better. You are coming on the back of priesthood. Not just zeal. Not just uh, lip, lip, you know, lip talk. You are coming on the back of priesthood. You have been sitting and are cooking and baking yourself in prayer. So it is actually within you to do what it takes. It is within you to actually withstand the enemy. To resist him as long as possible until he has to take his things and leave. Many of us don't realize that this thing that we're up against is actually a winnable fight. I think that's what I want to just give to you guys today. Because many times when we talk about generational stuff, the problem is that many of us are listening to it as the first people in our family. So we are in our heads thinking, well, if you are telling me that this thing started from my great-grandfather and my grandfather and my whatever, what, what makes you think that I actually can finish it? I'm trying to tell you now that the warfare can actually be finished. The battle is actually winnable. The war can actually come to an end. It's just that nobody has stood up. That's all it is. That's all it is. The war can actually be ended. So I don't want you to sit here and be thinking in the same way Elijah was thinking and saying, oh, I know better than my father. So let this thing just end now. Why? Because the, th the thing that Jezebel tried to do to him is what many of the other prophets before him had suffered. They had already suffered the same thing. So he was thinking, oh, I'm not better. Meanwhile, half of those prophets, they had already gone to start, you know, bowing to bow, you know, all kinds of things. But even Satan knows that you are different. You are cut from a different cloth. You are the one who needs to realize that. You are the one who needs to know that. You have what it takes. You have it within you to finish this battle. Yes, it might have been however many generations before, but you have what it takes. That is what I want to learn today before I end the meeting. Because many times, it, it, it almost seems as though, oh, this thing is never ending. This thing, will, no, it will not always be there. It will not always be there. That war will be won eventually. That war will be won eventually. One battle on another, one battle after another, it will be won. It takes you being willing to stand. Oppose the system. Oppose the system. And understand that unlike Vashti, you have the backing to actually get it done. This book is so instructive. It's so rich. If you look, if you just sit down and start picking each word, each statement, he says, let's give it to someone who is better than she. Now, I'm not trying to say that. I'm not trying to, please, I have the most respect for your parents. I, you know, I do too, you know. And, you know, I talk about, you know, stuff like that here. The truth is your parents did the best that they could with what they had. Your parents did the best they could with what they knew. And you have more. So you're going to have to do the same. It's like Vashti. She did the best with what she could. And at that time, it was her willpower. It was her zeal. It was her passion. It was her desire for change. And all of that was great. All of that was good. It just wasn't enough because there is a factor that you need if you're going to stand up against the enemy. You are going to need to be backed by God. You are going to need to be fighting with God. Not alone. And you have that. You have that. So you actually can put this battle to an end. If you can't still believe this, I want you to see what happened with Esther and Mordecai. They actually put it to an end. Haman was hung. Haman died. Do you understand that? Oh my goodness, this is so powerful. They actually put it to bed. They actually put it to bed once and for all. Between the two of them, between Esther and Mordecai, they actually put it to bed 
This long-standing monument of disobedience, this long-standing monument of iniquity that opened the door for generational curses, for generational uh, 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 afflictions, patterns, familial spirits, all kinds of things. This thing that opened the door, someone was actually able to get up. Not just fight so that they can escape, but fight and take it down. Haman died. Their next generation did not have to fight a Haman. They didn't just escape Haman like, oh, we just, by tactic, were able to, you know, take power out of his hands for that time. And no, they didn't shut him up. They killed him. They took him out. And I'm telling you that you have the ability to do the same. You can sit down and be crying, or you can realize that this is where you are. You can either try to dodge by the side and escape, they could have done the same. Let's just, we go. that's what Esther was trying to do. Like, you know what? Let's just avoid this man and his problems. And Monica said, no, that's not what we're doing. We're actually taking him out. We're taking him out. And that's what you're doing. That's what God has put you in place to do. So that family you are in, where you feel frustrated about what's going on with everybody, where you feel frustrated about what you have to be up against. You're just trying to sleep and it's almost as though you're fighting half the time. You're, listen, it's because hey man can be taken out. And the beautiful thing is that Haman typically is looking for a man like him. That's why he was looking for Mordecai. He was fighting Mordecai this whole time. All his eyes were, let me just get this Mordecai. He did not know that there was an Esther. Because the truth is, warriors are typically not trained in a spa. That's where they trained Esther. Warriors are typically not trained in a spa. So that's why he didn't expect that. He just thought, he's like, oh my goodness, that is the wisdom of God. So his entire focus, 100%, was on Mordecai. He never thought it would be Esther. He never thought it would be her. Because you do not expect that a warrior is trained in a spa. So you're out here looking like, a, you know, just, you know, one of that lady, one of that girl, just this, you know, little person, this frail little lady. Who? The Haman that has withstood your family does not know that that lady that frail looking girl, this girl, is the one that's actually going to take his head off. Is the one that's actually going to bring him to an end. So yes, he can be looking at Mordecai. He can be focused on that. That's all his strategy is being built around. Like, I'm going to come at this Mordecai and all. He doesn't know that there's an Esther in the background. Trained in the spa, but just as capable of battle. Just as capable of warfare. And that's where you stand. That's the position you occupy today. You indeed are better. You're working with more. You're working with the power of priesthood. You're working with God. You're working with, like, like Shade put it, like you're working um, as one who is in blood covenant with Jesus. That is deep. That is deep. You are working as one who is in blood covenant with Jesus. How does Haman survive that? It's not possible. It's not. You just need to be aware of that and be willing to stand. So I don't know how you've been feeling recently. I don't know what it has felt like for you. I don't know if it has been feeling like, you know what, it feels like the heat is mounting. I felt like everything was fine and now it's almost as though these things are coming at me. I'm just tired. I don't like this. I don't have time for that. Listen, you have what it takes. Maybe this is a pit stop today. This meeting is a pit stop. That's what it is for you. It's just you're stopping on the journey. You just need to get more gas. You just need to pick a few more snacks. That's all it is for you. It's not, you don't, this is not the, your, your destination. This is not the end of the journey. This is just you stopping on the road to stretch your legs a little bit, to just rest a little bit, get some gas. Why? Because you are going on this journey and you are actually going to finish it. This is what the Lord wants to do for us today is to just pour more strength in our vessels. Pour more strength in our vessels. This is your rest stop. This is your rest stop. You know, when you're traveling here, well, here in the years, they have those places. They are literally rest stops. You pull off from the highway completely and you just go in there. And they make them look really nice so that you can have things to do. You stretch your legs, you drink some water, you use the restroom, you know, you rest a little bit. Even if you do it at a gas station, you know, you fill up your tank and all of that. That's what we're doing today. Because, listen, I, like you, want to sit down and chill and just, you know, be a nice little girl and just have a nice little life. But there's a bigger assignment for you. Someone needs to take your man down in your family. Somebody started it, so you're not going to let their effort be in vain. Maybe they couldn't finish it, but they did start it. They fought for it as much as they could. They fought and pushed the enemy back as much as they could. That's why you are even where you are. You are not even starting from where they had to start from. 
So you don't get to give up. What you do is you just replenish your resources and you continue. So we're going to come off mute and we're going to pray. And this is what God is going to do for us today is that he's just going to push more strength into you. That's all it is that's going on today. It's more strength because I'm believing that you now understand the situation you find yourself in. I'm believing you now understand where you are, what you're up against. And this is just what God wants to do for us. More strength for the journey. Because Haman actually can be killed. Haman can actually be taken down. So I need you all to please come off mute. I need you all to come off mute and begin to pray. Because we are receiving strength. We are receiving fuel. We are receiving reinforcement. We are receiving everything that it is that we need to stay in that fight. Many of us are still up against deep things. Please begin to pray. Begin to pray. If you're on YouTube, please navigate back to Tim's. Begin to pray. 